The reason for it becomes even more clear when we now get into episode four. Naturally, it picks up with Suzuku being questioned about the assassination, which is basically, confess or we'll beat the confession out of you. This is all part of an agenda. Their reasoning is, well, it's the purest form of nonsense. Britannians can never commit a crime. Ergo, if only Britannians are in the military, they will be completely trustworthy. So by making an honorary Britannian the scapegoat, we can keep all of those unworthy people out. This naturally does not stand up to even the slightest amount of logic. Much like the use of the term BOGO. Buy one, get one really should be the expected minimum in any transaction. Lelouch assures his sister that what the news says isn't true, but he also has plans of his own, making some arrangements with the guy, I'm going to guess he's a servant, because he's the one whose ass was saved by Lelouch taking over that chess match in episode one. The guy makes some kind of arrangements, not sure what, only that it involves a sliding system. So it could be a gun, or some kind of retractable port in armor, or I suppose it could be a way to get from his room to class like a water park. Whee! Old Labcoat and his assistant are also lamenting the fact that they made Suzaku the scapegoat. He was perfect for their project, and no other unit is going to want to give up one of their best pilots, so it's basically starting from scratch with a replacement. Of course, that's hardly the worst to come from this. Oh no, the prince has been horribly murdered, and a completely innocent man is being framed purely for political reasons. I know, I know, and I am going to be seriously inconvenienced in my work. Not to mention how there will be nothing good to watch on television for the next several days without tying it up. Oh, heavy is the burden that is mine. As for Lelouch, he heads to that rendezvous, telling his friends that he's decided to retire from their matches for a more interesting opponent. Though at least having the sense not to disappear with a smoke bomb. He leaves a phone for Colin and uses that to tell her to take her group on a little train ride. But first, we cut away from her an important announcement. Lord Jeremiah. I wanted to inform you that my eyes are up here. Jeremiah is arranging for Suzaku's trip to face justice to be as public a spectacle as possible, and is personally going to assure, ensure that any attempt to rescue him will end badly. And if this is how they treat an ally, you don't want to know how they treat an enemy. Being horse-swept through the streets is going to seem kind. Anyway, the reason for the train ride is to show the visible injustice of Britannia's rule, and then to follow it up by Lelouch introducing himself. Because he's concerned about appearances, he has chosen a disguise. Fucking you. That? You look like the Count if he was hosting an upper-class sex party. This party is brought to you by Six and Nine! Ah, 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 ah. Lelouch wants to make sure they understand what it is they're doing. Simple terrorism is not going to cut it. Hurting the innocent will just blow up in their face. They need to fight Britannia itself. And they're like, yeah, that's all well and good. But why listen to you? Someone who looks like he showed up for Phantom of the Opera the next generation. They want to see his face. But that would defeat the purpose of the mask, so he says... Hiding behind that mask! Why should we even trust you? She's right! Lose the mask! Right. Are you going to show us your face or not? Very well. I'll show you. But rather than my face, bear witness to my power. Oh, Lelouch has a future in politics, all right. Yes, I'll show you my face, by which I mean, no, I won't. Meanwhile, a military resistance movement is debating whether to try to rescue Suzaku, and their leader decides, reluctantly, to choose no. But not to worry, Suzaku isn't defeated yet. Not much luck on your end, though. You may be getting a trial, but no one is pulling for you, certainly. But the courts are where truth comes to light. The <laughs> <laughs> oh. I admire your courage in making jokes at a time like this. It's a shame they're going to kill you. So he's carried through the streets before a jeering crowd. The perfect picture of a man on his way to a fair trial, held by a Quintesson. And all for the people at home to see, thanks to the news cameras. <laughs> what a circus this is. And I'm as corrupt as any of them. It's just a pity I lost my inner monologue during the war. This is insane. We know that Suzaku is innocent. The court deemed our testimony inadmissible. On the grounds that it showed he was innocent. Voices of scorn, growing ever louder. 
Voices bearing testament to a people's love of their prince, raining their judgment down on a terrorist. I've seen witches in medieval England who had a fairer shake than this guy. Jeremiah is not only prepared, but he is hoping that the terrorists will attack. So when he hears that someone is driving the prince's car towards the procession, he's delighted. Colin and one of the others showed up to try this, so Lelouch had them build a replica, uh, from the outside, of the prince's car as part of the plan, suspecting that Jeremiah would know what was going on and let them through, thinking that he could steal the limelight from them. It allows Lelouch to then reveal himself before everyone. Uh, obviously not actually, because that would defeat the purpose of the mask. He calls himself Zero, because you can't be divided by me. Zero shows just how Jeremiah played into his hands as he reveals the thing behind him, the canister from the truck. They all thought it was poison gas, like the co cover story said, so the Britannians think that he's capable of poisoning everyone here. Hundreds, if not thousands of Britannians. Even if Jeremiah did manage to seal himself inside safely. And that would look a little bad, to say the least. Zero makes his demand. An exchange. The canister for Suzaku. To make it easier to do that, Zero confesses that he's the one who killed the prince and threatens to reveal something about Orange. Well, this is to provide cover for him, then, to command Jeremiah to allow them and Suzaku to leave unharmed. It makes it seem like Orange is something so compromising that Jeremiah would rather attack his own people than let it become public knowledge. Between that and the canister spraying gas to make the crowd panic, it's harmless, actually. You know, unless you count making a crowd panic as being harmful which you probably should. Well, our heroes manage to escape anyway and get back to the base. The would-be revolutionaries debate the night's outcome then. On the one hand, it was all just razzmatazz, which isn't something you can really rely upon long term. On the other hand, it did work. You can't argue with success. Well, I mean, actually, that aphorism isn't so cut and dry. I mowed down five pedestrians, but I got the package delivered on time. You can't argue with success. But you can't argue in this case that it wasn't a success. Freeing a political prisoner from in the middle of a televised parade without firing a single bullet and surrounded by enemy killer robots, that's a pretty impressive achievement. If he said his next trick was to win synchronized swimming without getting wet, I'd at least give him the benefit of the doubt. Well, Zero gives Suzaku a speech about joining him now that he has seen the corruption of Britannia. But Suzaku is convinced that changing within the system is preferable than warfare. So he's heading off to his court-martial. Seriously, he is. You can't argue that he's not all in on this white knight thing. And he'll probably show up at the court-martial riding a horse named Justice. That's just the way he does things. There's only one thing that would be more surprising. All of this, we now turn to our legal analyst. Misayako? I have just one question to ask you, child. Is this your card? This four-episode arc introduces us to a number of characters, but the one that we most spend time with is Lelouch. What we would discover about him quickly is that he is self-absorbed, save for his sister, and a skilled strategist. This, I think, suggests that what we are seeing isn't as clear-cut as it seems. There is nothing, after all, to really convince Lelouch to give up his selfish ways and embrace the plight of the Elevens. So why does he? What we saw in Episode 2 was using the terrorists to his own ends, even while working with them. Now, he doesn't betray them, but he handles the entire situation like the chess matches that he is accustomed to. Use your pieces to allow the opponent to leave the king exposed. This just happened to involve helping the ones carrying out his orders. What only mattered to him in the end was to get access to the exposed prince. While he's not so self-absorbed that he doesn't allow the fight to continue, his only concern is getting answers for what he wants. Killing the prince may or may not have been to help the Elevens in his mind, but what it also does is create a power vacuum to allow another member of the royal family, one who is more likely to have the answers, to arrive. Likewise, fomenting an open and effective rebellion would be likely to bring in such people as well. In other words, Lelouch's role in this revolu revolution does not need to be much, or indeed at all, about the Elevens themselves, 
but rather about how it can help his own long-term goal of getting answers and likely revenge. We'll have to see how that shakes out when we return to Code Geass. the inside, sullying the meeting with her filthy mind? Yeah, well, that's Millie for you. 